All right. Welcome to our May Word for Word event. This is one that we're especially excited about, a panel event we've been wanting to do for a long time now. A couple of years ago, we hosted a panel focusing on the traditional path to publication. In the two years since, non-traditional paths have become increasingly important. So tonight we've conven convened a panel to explore some of them. My name is Paul Whitcover. I'm the Associate Dean of the Online MFA here at Southern New Hampshire University. And I'm here with Jacob Powers, who's the Associate Dean of the BA and MA Creative Writing Programs at Southern New Hampshire University. Um, we are thrilled to be joined by our three distinguished panelists tonight. Uh, before I introduce them, I just want to um, remind you about the Q&A that's up here at the top of your screen and the fact that we are recording uh, tonight's event. If you don't want to be uh, captured in, in uh, any portion of the recording, then um, do not participate in the chat. Um, after the event, uh, the recording of this um, word for word will be made available on our YouTube channel. And so stay tuned for information about that. Um, OK, and I think, Jacob, you're going to introduce our panelists. Sounds good. Uh, thanks so much, Paul, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, yes, we're very excited to welcome three uh, distinguished guests tonight, each of whom have built a successful career by exploring and creating alternate publishing pathways for themselves and others. Um, so it gives me great uh, pleasure to introduce all three. Uh, I will start with Gavin Grant, who is a writer and editor and publisher of Small Beer Press, which is a well-regarded indie press that he runs with his wife, Kelly Link. Uh, the two also published the biannual zine Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet. Originally from Scotland, Grant immigrated to the United States in 1991 and has worked in bookshops in LA, Boston, East Hampton, and for the American Booksellers Association. Uh, Small Beer may be an indie press, but they publish a roster of award-winning authors. Uh, any of the big five would envy from Ursula K. Le Guin uh, to Jeffrey Ford, uh, Sophia Samatar, uh, Sarah Pinksker, uh, Elizabeth Hand, and many more. Uh, learn more about uh, Small Beer Press at smallbeerpress.com. So welcome, Gavin. Next, we... Yep, no problem. I, I, I should just I should just mention that Small Beer Press is having a 70% off warehouse sale right now. So there you go. Just sure. just so saying. Head on over there. Um, <laughs> but wait at, until after this event. You know? yes. <laughs> or or multitask if you want. <laughs> um, let me introduce our next guest as well, Michael Laron. Uh, he's the outreach manager for the Alliance of Independent Authors. Uh, he has published over 90 science fiction and fantasy novels and self-help books uh, for writers. Uh, somehow he also finds time for his award-winning YouTube channel, Author Level Up. And I, I just have no idea how he finds the time, but congratulations. <laughs> um, our MFA students might recognize him from some of our class resources. Um, you can find him at Michael. A ron.com and authorlevelup.com. And I'll post all of these websites as well in the chat when we're done. So welcome, Michael. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, thank you. And uh, finally, we have Terry Maggard. Uh, he's left handed, as am I, which is great. I think <laughs> anyone else left handed here? Okay, so Terry and I win. No. Uh, <laughs> we <laughs> He likes dragons, coffee. I like coffee as well. Uh, waffles, running, and giraffes in no particular order. It seems like there's a specific order there, though. <laughs> well, <I> just... <laughs> He's the author of Halfway Witchy, Messenger, Starcaster, Shattered Skies, and Amazon's best-selling backyard, backyard Starship series, as well as a contributor to many anthologies. Uh, Terry's a former instructor in the online MFA here, so we're constantly trying to lure him back. Um, but unfortunately for us, though fortunately for him, uh, he keeps writing bestsellers. So you can find him online at terrymaggart.com. And Terry, welcome back. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Um, well, I, I guess I can get the ball rolling and then I'll hand it over to my uh, colleague, Paul, to ask a couple questions too. Uh, we'll do a few scripted questions and stuff first. And as Paul mentioned, folks, if you have any questions for the publishing panel, um, hop onto the Q&A. You might not see it at the top unless you hit those three ellipses that say more. And then there will be a Q&A option there that you can uh, select and ask questions for our panelists. But to start off, um, so each of you wear a number of hats in your current publishing role. Uh, there's editor, publisher, writer, designer. Um, so tell us a bit about your journeys um, in the publishing industry. How did you end up where you are today? And 
what do today's aspiring writers need to know about uh, fashioning careers of their own? Um, Michael, let's start with you. Sure. So I, I got my start in self-publishing in 2012. So it's almost 11 years ago. So I, I was on a nice dinner with my wife and I, I fell ill with what I thought was food poisoning. Turned out to be a little bit more severe than that. And I had a near-death experience. And up until that point in my career, I had tried to I tried to look for publishers, tried to go the traditional route, but it just kind of wasn't working. And so I, I, I just realized like it, you know, I'm, I'm on a hospital bed. I don't know what's going to happen to me. Like if I'm going to take the chance of being a writer, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it now or I'm just never going to do it. And so I decided to, to jump into it that way. And right around that time was when I found the Alliance of Independent Authors and uh, Ally for short is what they what they go by. And they are a nonprofit organization whose goal is to give as much good advice on self-publishing to authors who want to pursue the independent route for publishing. And so I found Ally right around that point. I found some other really great resources and I just jumped into it whole hog. And I was pretty fortunate. I, I I didn't make a whole lot of money to start, but I I slowly as I went through, I learned the process of what does it take to to produce a, a novel that looks like a traditional publisher? What does it take to write a novel on the level of a traditional publisher? And what are the best selling authors doing that I'm not doing currently? Um, how do I market a book? And you know, back in the bad old days of self-publishing, and it's really not bad old days because it's not really a true thing to say, but back in 2012, things were a lot different than they are now. I mean, you, authors had to do everything. I mean, th there there was such a thing as a cover designer. There there were such a thing as book formatters, but the, the authors that succeeded were the ones who learned how to do almost everything themselves. And so you kind of had to become a jack of all trade. And so to, to get to the second part of the question, I think all of you are, are really fortunate to be coming into the industry at, at what I think is probably the most consequential and pivotal time, certainly in the history of, of being an author, at least in self-publishing, because of tools like artificial intelligence, because of advancements and different apps that allow you to basically format a book in the click of a button. You know, five years from now, you know, you may be able to to type in what you want and get a book cover, you know, maybe even sooner than that. So the era of being able to have to do all those things yourself, I think, is is kind of over. And the hardest part is really just writing the book. So as I look at my journey, I'm, I'm grateful for all the things that I had to learn. But, um, you know, it, it, it's a lot better now than it was 10 years ago. And so I, I think, you know, if, if there's anything I just want to instill in this group is that this is an incredible time to be an author, probably one of the, the best times that's ever existed. And there's a lot that I think you'll be able to take advantage of. Awesome. Oh, thank you, Michael. Uh, T Terry, what, what are your thoughts on, on what Michael says here? I mean, are we in the golden era of uh, publishing and everything because of, um, you know, tools like artificial intelligence and stuff coming out where we can kind of put aside all of the stresses of finding cover jet covers and book covers and writing out letters and all that kind of stuff and focusing on the craft itself or? I, I think, first of all, Michael and I share, like our experience seems to be, I, I started in 2012, 2013 as well. I've seen two or three iterations about every three, three or four years, Amazon gets aggressive and tries to crush us. And we, uh, we yep. uh, negate their efforts and find a way to work around it. We're very creative about quick response teams. Uh, that's our social media is basically a network of us trying to undo things that are done to us so that we can thrive in this uh, publishing ecosphere. Um, and once again, you know, Vellum and all these wonderful programs, this is the good days right now because you can do the thing that is most important, which is what Michael said, write the book. And I and I will, I'll go one sentence farther and this is a little bit of tough love, but um, nobody, um, when you open your mouth and tell somebody that you're a writer, you've got a 75% chance that their first sentence is going to be, you know, I was going to write a book. And, <laughs> and they, everybody says that. And I always tell people, well, go ahead and write it. The other issue is um, some people want to talk about writing. And I get a great deal of joy from talking about writing, but I also get a great deal of joy from writing and completing things. Um, and I think that one of the things that you learn to focus on is if you're the person responsible, and we have 11 employees at Variant Publications now, 
Uh, so we have 11 families dependent on us getting 3,000 words a day and things like that. Um, so it is an art, but it is also a craft. And the distinction between the two, I think, as Michael mentioned, is right now is the best time to explore that and uh, treat it as a career. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And and Gavin, um, do you want to share briefly your, your journey and how Small Beer Press has changed over the years with this technology as well? And Yep. Uh, my journey was that I was 26 and I was working at a bookstore and I realized that no one cared about my writing and I should start a zine and publish everybody else's writing. Okay. Um, uh, I kept doing that for a couple of years with my girlfriend of the time. And then we started publishing books and nobody wanted to know about uh, self-published books. So we had to, we got a lot of help, a lot of help. Um, people who had, people who were working for big publishers, small publishers, people who had run presses, published magazines themselves. Uh, we just, we, we would just go up to them and say, can we buy you a drink? Can we, can we <laughs> your brain? Can we ask you so many questions that your partner will leave this bar in disgust? Um, <laughs> you know, the, the publishing, it changes so fast, as Terry said, every two or three years, every four or five years, everything's different. There's some stuff that remains the same, but you know, you, you kind of have to keep uh, looking forward, but also turning around and helping the next people along because, yeah. you know, we got so much help. Uh, they, we need to keep passing that along. So we, we publish uh, traditional books uh, and ebooks, you know, for 15 years. Uh, we published our first books, I guess, in 2001. And we published two books a year to start with because we had no money. You know, we had a little bit of money because I was working for the American Booksellers Association. My wife was working. So, but we weren't going to kind of bet the non-existent farm on that. So uh, we did it very slowly, two books a year for a couple of years. And we still, you know, our aim is between six and 10 books a year. Uh, that's kind of a, a doable, very small press. We expanded a bit and then we shrank a bit and we've kind of hit a steady state. I do not, I'm not, I'm hoping this is not a panel about artificial intelligence. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we, I, might, we might I, discuss it at some at some yeah, point because I, I think it does have implications in in our business. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. It's just the basis of every conversation yes. in the past six months. But yes, you know, I'm I'm really happy in terms of tools that uh, I can use stuff like Affinity, Affinity Design, Affinity Publish as a an alternative to Adobe InDesign because Adobe InDesign is like this creaking monster in publishing that you kind of have to use for to design a book um but oh my gosh uh if someone out there doesn't have to use it it's it's a it's a great time so find find those alternate programs that you know might be a, so is it there it's just a little bit more navigable and stuff is that my understanding and everything yeah, then you also won't be paying a subscription fee for the rest of your life well, that's a that's a plus too. <laughs> so, so, Paul, uh, uh, yeah, I'm okay. sorry. I, I wanted I wanted to kind of get a a couple of definitions down on the um on the table so that we are uh, clear on on what type of publishing specifically we're talking about uh, in various scenarios. So, a lot of times I hear like um, hybrid publishing. I hear indie publishing. I hear self publishing. What is the difference between these various um, terms, if any? Like like somebody like like Terry, you have a you you are a self published author, but you also have you're also essentially a small press because you have uh, you know you have a, a staff and you do a lot of stuff um, that traditionally a small press would do. Gavin, your small beer is a small press, uh, an indie press. Um, it, it occupies kind of a halfway position, I, I would say, maybe between something more traditional and something that's completely you know seat of the pants type publishing. So anyway, I don't want to take up more time, but just that's the kind of uh, distinctions I I'd like to hear you you all make. Yeah, I, I, I can start. I, I would say self-publishing is also known as independent publishing. It just means that you're an author who is publishing independent of a publisher. So you're still hiring people to help you. It's a team effort, 
right? You're hiring an editor, you're hiring a cover designer, but you just don't have a publisher who is publishing the work. You might publish under your own publishing company. And, you know, to Terry's point, or to the point he made about Terry, you could have a small press that publishes other authors. But generally speaking, the self-published author is publishing their own their own work independent of a publisher. Um, a hybrid publisher is typically a, a, a publisher that is, they will, they will help the author, at least how we define it at Ally, is they will help the author produce the book. So the author pays an upfront fee and the publisher will help the author with the cover design, produce the book, but the author keeps all the royalties. They're really just there to help the author get their feet off the ground and help them get that first book published. But the author keeps all the rights. At least that's how it should be if you're using hybrid publishing. And then, you know, I'll let the other two gentlemen take the other definitions. What was the question? <laughs> or what, what other definition yeah. would we like to? Yeah, Mike, Michael did I, that I heard self-publishing and, and hybrid publishing. Did we need yeah, to define and, traditional as well? Well, I, I guess um, I guess I would be interested to hear Gavin. You talk a little bit about like what distinguishes small press, small beer from a more traditional uh, publisher. Uh, probably the the lack of zeros on your check when we give <laughs> you an advance. Uh, our address in Mass in Western Massachusetts instead of New York or Minneapolis or LA. Um, but so we're a small press with two people, me and my wife. Um, you know, we use, uh, we work with freelance artists and proofreaders and so on. But um, we, so the, the indie press is, as I sort of grew up knowing it was like the indie music, you know, it was coming from small bands, small publishers, that kind of thing, who were independent of the big seven, six, five, however many are left, the larger publishers. And then, you know, the indie press and the small press are, were sort of the same thing as a crossover, a, a Venn diagram of, you know, here's the small presses and here's the indie presses. It's kind of the same thing. Um, and one of their sort of, their go-tos is that the money flows to the author. The money, the author never pays for anything. You know, that's a, it used to be vanity publishing, uh, which was a pretty, which still goes on and, you know, uh, is, is very useful for, you know, when I am old and no one wants to publish my memoir, the vanity publisher next in the next town over will print 82 copies of a very nice book for me. And that's great, but it, it's not a useful thing for getting your book out any further than your family and friends. Um, so... The small, the small and independent presses, uh, we are different from the larger presses in that you're going to know exactly who to blame if something goes wrong. <laughs> and you're, you're going to know who to, who to pick up the phone and email when you have a question. You know, um, I'm doing an event, will the books be there? Ask Gavin, you know, uh, is the cover of my book going to appear on Edelweiss uh, book selling website? Is it going to appear? at the right time for booksellers, ask Gavin. He will, you know, he will have the answer, yes or no. And it's the same for a lot of the small presses. I think that's enough. One thing I think that that writers who are, who are hearing all of this and, and thinking about, well, which of these options is, is something I should be per interested in pursuing, which is which makes the most sense for me, is um, how, how do you navigate uh, through the, the paths of risk that are associated? And I don't and I don't mean just like the normal risk that's associated with any publishing venture, but but the kind of risk of, of falling prey to a scam, um, you know, trusting an untrustworthy um, uh, publisher, hybrid press, or whatever. How, what are some of the warning signs, and how do you manage to safely, um, you know, navigate your way through to publication? Yeah, I, I can take this one. I can start. Um, at Ally, we that's that's one of the reasons we were founded, right? Is to help shine a light on the service providers that are doing a really good job for authors 
and the ones who are not doing a really good job for authors because sunlight is the best disinfectant, right? And there are a lot of good people in the publishing community who deserve to have their voices amplified. And there are some who are unfortunately not doing a, a very good job and, and may, maybe don't have scruples. And so what we do at Ally is we have a watchdog service and it's it's at selfpublishingadvice.org is where you can find us. And we have a watchdog and that's that's our watchdog's job is to be on the lookout for companies that are doing a really good job and we rate them based on uh, how how well they're doing. What what are people saying about their customer service? What are they saying about the value? And we invite anybody that has had an experience with a company that um, uh, maybe it hasn't been good or maybe it's been really good. We we want to know about that. And so we have a ratings directory on our site. That's a really great start because you've got a company that, or a, a, an organization like Ally that is vetting a lot of these services for you. That will help you avoid a fair amount. There's there's also websites like Writer Beware um, run by Victoria Strauss that um, do a really good job of shining a light on unscrupulous people. I, I think ultimately at the end of the day, what it boils down to is – are they promising something that is just completely outside of what people would typically get? Are they promising you results really quickly? You know, because we all know, or at least, you know, the, probably the four of us on this call, results don't happen that quickly in this business, right? I mean, no one gets, no one gets rich quick uh, as a writer. And so there are people who have success, but that success is usually because of good craft. It's because maybe they were in the right place at the right time. And more importantly, it's because they've worked pretty hard over a long period of time to get there. So if someone is trying to promise you super fast results in helping you get rich quick, that's red flag number one. Red flag number two, and then I'll stop, is just just do do Google searches on companies. I mean, you'd be surprised at what you can find by just asking around in different communities, what is someone's experience with this company? And you you will usually find everything you need to know by talking to just a few authors or just looking, just doing a quick Google search and seeing, hey, wait a minute, this company, you know, the quality of their books isn't so good, or uh, maybe their th th their contracts are a little hinky, you know. And these days, and like I said, that's why this is this is such a great time to be an author because ten years ago, a lot of these resources didn't exist, nobody knew, and so now, um, getting information is really just a Google search away. There's a there's also a site uh, predators and editors, is another good one where uh, like my, I'm sure we know the same names of people you, uh, like a, like a bad penny people keep turning up they just rebrand they hang out another sign they rename themselves and they try and exploit people uh, they're preying fundamentally on your thirst as a creator that you you know and it's always the same the the hustle is always the same they say your story needs to be told. You know, it's always something and they over promise. The exploitation is unbelievable. I have had a physical chill go down my spine sometimes when I talk to people and it's always the same person to this kind, wonderful person who's written a memoir about horses or something like that. And, you know, and they've gotten taken for $11,500 or something for a, a, a 20 minute copy edit and a $10 cover and it's just so frustrating to see it happen because it genuinely culls the herd in terms of the healthy ecosphere it takes a lot of talent out of the pool um it gives legitimate people a bad name um it steals money which is hard-earned money for a lot of people that this is their dream um and unfortunately it has kept going on like i when we started around 2012 2013 it was like the tools weren't there. Now they are, and it still happens. And I think it's because the class of people coming in changes every year. There's a new freshman class, so to speak, you know, of people who are being brought into this and sold a dream and and uh, taken for a significant uh, amount of money. Well, and don't forget that uh, when you have a dream, you know, people are willing to spend money to get there. And some kind, sometimes no matter what it takes, and the the predators know that, and yep. so they're they're always willing to feed off of that energy. So just as an author, you have to be cognizant of that desire 
right? That all of us are on this call because we we have this dream and we want to sacrifice some time and energy and, and if we can money to get there, just know that sometimes that can be used against you. And and the moment you understand that, then you'll you'll be able to avoid scams. Because they're looking for easy prey. They're they're not going to look for somebody that that knows what's going on. So taking all of the advice in mind that, that was shared already uh, and some, I mean, double checking uh, re- references, seeing, you know, how the website looks, whether it's a, a get rich quick scheme and stuff like that, um, you know, whether or not they're asking for a lot of money up front and stuff um, there, there, we've got a lot of questions, um, pre-scripted questions, uh, as well as questions uh, that are in the chat um, about money in general um seed money i suppose is what they're asking about uh, for the most part like you know what is the cost for starting an indie publishing company or the cost for self-publication or the cost of hiring an editor um and i know there's no clear answer to this it's nine dollars it's not that right it's it's not it's not there's not a set figure right oh i wish wish it was was nine dollars uh right it's it's a little bit more than that i assume but like you know, if if you could give ballpark figures or like what what should writers start saving for if they do want to take you know these these ventures and 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 go in these routes, and not a specific number. Yeah, I can again, start. I can, I'll, I'll start. I'll, I'll I'll take the tomatoes first. Okay. Okay. So I I get asked this question all the time, Uh-oh. and inevitably inevitably there's. So here's what I'm going to say before I answer the numbers, all right? And that is that no matter who you are, no matter how much money you have, there is a budget that you can follow in publishing. There is always somebody who can meet your budget, always. Um, if, If I became destitute tomorrow, I guarantee you I could find somebody for whatever my budget was to publish my book. Now, there is a certain level of quality that you might sacrifice, but there really is no excuse to not be able to hire an editor or a cover designer because there are always options. All right, I'm just gonna say that. So so, so, so that if the numbers I say next give you sticker shock, just remember what I just said. All right, so for so basically there are, there are two main, well, Two, two main elements that you need to be able to produce a book. The first is a cover design and the second is editing. So for a cover design, there are different options. The first option is you can pay for what's called a pre-made cover, which is where a designer pre-makes the cover. They put it on a marketplace or somewhere where you can purchase it. You buy it, they put your name and your title of the book cover on there, and then it's as if it's your own personal design. All right. And pre-made covers used to be really cheap. You can get them these days anywhere from $7,500 to about $200 on the top end for the high-end designers. All right. Now, you can get a custom design where a designer will – you get basically give them the information of the book, and then they design it for you. That's going to cost you a couple hundred dollars. Designers who have been in business for longer tend to charge more. Designers who have been in business less tend to charge less. So you can always find somebody in whatever sweet spot you're looking at. So I would tell people anywhere from $7,500 up to $500 um, for a a solid cover design. Some people pay more for that for cover design, but that's generally speaking what you can expect. Um, And then for editing, it depends on the types of editing, right? So there's developmental editing where they look at the big picture of your story. They help you with the structure, the plot kind of the big picture things. That's the most expensive type of editing you can buy. And it's going to cost you anywhere from several hundred dollars on the high end or on on several hundred, the high end of several hundred dollars, all the way up to several thousand dollars. It's the most expensive type of editing you can buy. Not necessarily needed or recommended for every author out there, but then there's copy editing, which will usually run you a few hundred dollars per manuscript, depending on how um, how big your manuscript is and how much work it needs. I think every every author needs a copy editor. And if, if you can afford it, a proofreader. Um, and that will also run you right around that same range. So, you know, if you do the math, you know, you're, you're looking at, you know, high end of a couple hundred dollars all the way up to, you know, a little bit over a thousand maybe. Um, but remember what I said before, that there there are options if you don't have that as well. And I'm happy to talk about that if people want to know more. So um, you guys can share you. your numbers now. 
Yeah, can I pass over to um, uh, Gavin with uh, uh, indie presses and stuff first, and then Terry, I, I, well, I want to uh, talk to you uh, as well, since you know you moved away from teaching to do self-publishing, what your journey was in terms of costs and stuff as well. But uh, Gavin, to get started, um, how you know you said you started Small Beer Press. There's two people involved, you and you and Kelly Link, your your uh, spouse, um, and started with two books a year, but. Yeah still that money had to come from somewhere or or the resources had to come from somewhere. So what advice do you have for folks who want to ex, uh, explore into indie press or even perhaps indie journals or, or, or literary journals and stuff that they want to maybe uh, start from the ground up? Yeah, I, I don't recommend you start a literary journal unless you have a financial sponsor, a fiscal sponsor like a university or a college. Um, there's We started a zine because I saw a... Uh, I saw a billboard that said you can take a week's holiday in Miami for $200. And I thought, I don't want to go to Miami, but I do have $200. So I started the zine and that's how much it costs. You know, <laughs> if, you, if you want to publish something, you know, if you have a friend that works at Kinko's, it costs even less, you know, because they will often run it for free, right? But for <laughs> when we started publishing books, uh, the, you know, the, there were a lot of, of self-publishing and small publishing books that we read. And one of the things I'd read was that you need at least 2000 copies of a book for your distributor to get a decent uh, coverage across the country. You know, you don't want to print 700 copies and then all the bookstores in Oregon are like, but we ordered and we didn't get any books. This is sad. So, you know, as you print more, the unit cost goes down. But if you print 200 copies of a book, and you know it's a 250 page novel you know it costs you anywhere from 3000 very very cheap may not be very good we use a 30 percent recycled paper in all our books so you know it's probably going to cost if we printed 2000 it would cost like four thousand dollars um to get it into the store and that's after the costs that uh michael talked about you know um those costs are like that is that is our job. Hopefully, we are being paid for those uh, once we buy the book from somebody. Um, a while ago, I wrote something about how to start a small press, and it was basically: Do you have money that you're willing to spend? And if it all goes away, are you okay with that? It's just like anything, you know. Um, you buy something, you paid it, you you've got it. Do they sit in your warehouse? Do you sit in your basement getting damp? Don't store books in your basement. You know, do you have a plan for those books? Do you have a distributor? Um, if if you are tempted to start a small press, there are a lot of uh, a lot of resources, and the the main thing I would say is start it with some friends. Uh, it's very easy to burn out. Our our zine comes out twice a year because we knew people who had started quarterly magazines that burned out. Uh, you need you need a team a team of people a group who think this is a good idea a way to spend some time and it is fun you know and as a writer there is nothing like reading submissions from other writers to show you what you should and what you shouldn't be doing and it's not it's not as obvious as wow this person you know uh, writes in purple crayon because that that person may be brilliant right it may be Harold in the purple crayon but if you read a couple of hundred manuscripts, you will you will get a good idea of why people pick up something and stop reading in two pages. The same reason that you at a bookstore do the same thing. Oh, not for me, not for me, not for me. Ah, this one is for me. It's great fun. I'm away there, away from the money. Awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, it yeah, it's it, it's interesting to hear that you know. Without the funding of, of a, a you know university or something, literary journals are hard to get off the ground. And I think we're seeing that more and more often. Some of the the big ones are even you know moving away from what they originally started as. Tin House, I can think off the top of my head, as one of the huge ones, um, which now you know they they publish uh, books and stuff. But um, Glimmer Train is another two that I is off the top of my head. Um, so Terry, what about you? Um, I. From a monetary standpoint, I, my first novel was about uh, 81,000 words, and I published it in total for $475. Um, nice. And it was not a very good novel because it was all of the things that I don't do now. 
I was teaching myself how to write books. And with that being said, it my cost has gone up, but that's because um, I want different things. And I believe very powerfully in the cover. I think that mm-hmm. uh, I've mentioned before, and I used to tell my students, I said, you can't see personality across the room. You know, and my logic is that the cover absolutely captures people um, and font is important important. Like I'm a little bit of a maniac about font. I think readable font, I think a critical detail that gets overlooked. And I tell young writers, make sure that it's readable as a thumbnail because 70 to 80% of books are purchased from phones. And if you can't read it as a thumbnail and it's Gothic script or something like that, you're not, it might be wonderful, but you're not going to sell. So I like to preposition everything in my, in our sort of our cultural lexicon for our the Cheneyverse, we call it our universe. We like to have things that meet standards and at the same time, always over deliver. Um, like, you know, we're giving you a 120,000 word novel and I love to have the art. And then we have a full-time artist who does, we have a wiki for my backyard starship universe now. And I like, I, I'm a nerd from the seventies and eighties and I love you know, Michael Whalen, it, like Anne McCaffrey's covers just still captured my imagination to this day. So I love quality art. Uh, interior design is critical, like love the Florens and the Flourish, absolutely critical. And it takes a good experienced interior designer. We have a full-time graphic artist who's wonderful. And she's, she believes in the power of the, the, the punch of the first page. You look at it in that first the hook, that first really interesting letter, the Florens, all of it together, because you've got a short amount of time to make a first impression with this novel. Um, And I do the best I can as the author, but then the team turns it into a novel. Until until they get a hold of it, it's just a manuscript. And then once they do, um, so it has gone up considerably, but the product has gotten better. And the way that I know that the product got better is um, I think we're at 70,000 reviews for my back, the backyard universe and, and everybody, I love the cover and you listen to everybody and they tell you what you're doing right. And they also tell you things about, you know, who you are as a person and they don't like people with brown hair and I wish you weren't left-handed and everything, you know, all kinds of things like that. It gets personal, but in the, in the chaff are these great little bits of wisdom that you can apply towards making a better product and therefore a longer career. Always going after the left-handed people. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Go ahead, Paul. One one thing that's, that strikes me in listening to all of you is, is how attentive you are uh, toward uh, the publishing environment around you. And, and I, and by that, I mean, you know, not reader responses like Terry just mentioned, um, innovations in the field, like uh, Michael alluded to earlier, and as Gavin said, keeping one eye ahead, but also one eye behind uh, in order to help the next generation along. Um, do you think that that kind of uh, attentiveness, um, uh, because I'm going to just uh, just to sidetrack a little bit, I mean, a, a lot of times you think of like a self-published author is somebody who's got like tunnel vision, right? They want their book out there. They're going to, that's what they're focusing on exclusively. And yet what I'm hearing here is that there's actually more of a sense of community and um, there is a sense of responsibility maybe for each other uh, and for the publishing, the health of the publishing uh, industry itself on the, on the indie and, and uh, small press level. Is that, is that accurate? Is that, am I, am I correct in, in hearing that in what you're saying? I would say so. I, I would say that tunnel vision you referenced, it's, it still does exist. Uh, there are people who, they, they, when, you, when you publish your first book, I mean, it, it, in a way, that tunnel vision is actually helpful because by focusing on getting that first book out there, you can make all the mistakes in the world. And then when you publish that first book, then you really start playing the game, so to speak. So the sooner you get that first book out there, it's actually a good thing. Um, but yeah, I, I think that there has always been, there's, I think authors have always been very communal. We've always um, done a really good job of sharing our knowledge. I think that the conversations we're having now are a lot different though than say 10 years ago, right? So 10 years ago, the conversations we were having was using the dirty word that Terry used, product, 
Your book is a product. You know, you, your book is a product. You have to think about your book as a product. Oh man, you, I mean, just to get people to think about that was just a huge challenge. Now, I, I think most people agree that your book, you know, when you write the book, have as much fun as you want to have, right? And then when you finish it, figure out how to market it, how to get it in front of readers. Now, I think the conversation is how do how do we evolve with all of the new technology and all of the things that are coming down the pike? Um, you know, what does it mean to be an author in the 21st century? I think those are the conversations I think we have to have. And what does it look like? You know, what, what does the life of an author look like two, three years from now? Um, but it's, it's, it's a good thing. I think we have, you know, compared to other industries that I've worked in, we've got a pretty tight knit community and we have a very high ratio of people who are willing to just talk about their experiences. You know, they publish a book or they see some success and they're willing to talk about it. And you just don't get that always in other industries. A lot of people are a lot more guarded. Um, and that's that's a beautiful thing. And so, yeah, I think you're right, Paul. I mean, I, I think the most successful authors are the ones who share information because I think, you know, me personally, I had a lot of really good mentors starting off in my career. And so I, I almost feel like a responsibility that I have to find some way to give some of that back. I'm going to pull another uh, question out of our uh, Q&A here. Um, we've talked about the money that that it takes kind of upfront uh, to spend on the various uh, components of, of self-publishing your book. Um, and obviously, we can see from from uh, Gavin's response that these these costs don't go away when you're when you're dealing with a small press. It's just that they're not borne directly by the author. Um, what about the other side of the equation, though, which is like getting your book out there, getting it into stores, getting it in front of readers? How how is that done? What are the costs involved in that? And again, what are the what are like some of the the um, positive steps you can take, and what are some of the dangers to avoid? I would say that um, everything you can do before the public before the publication date is worth like three times as much as everything that comes after the publishing date you know the getting the word out um people we're all really simple beasts you know if everybody is talking about something we want to know what that thing is so you want to try and get as many people talking about that book before the book comes out so that when the book comes out People are like, oh, there's that thing that everybody's talking about. I want that thing. So and this, of course, is immensely hard because everybody else is also saying, but you should talk about my thing. You should talk about my TV show. Have you heard about kombucha? It's fascinating. No, 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 stop. Talk about my books. My books, my books. Uh, so I really liked what people were saying there about the community. Um, and part of it is that reaching out for... We sell, uh, we sell year in year out. We sell about sixty five percent print books, thirty five percent ebooks. You know, even when we have like uh, ebook goes off, um, it still comes out to about that. So a lot of our time is spent reaching out to independent bookstores, and um, we now have an independent bookstore in East Hampton. Uh, one came up for sale, and we were like, "Well, we cannot afford a bookstore," and then it turned out. We could afford the bookstore because this lady really wanted to retire. So good news for us. But um, it's really hard to stock an independent book, an indie published book in a bookstore if no one's heard of it. So it's been a real sort of eye-opening reminder that um, you need to get the books out to other booksellers uh, before the book is published. You need to send it out through the American Booksellers Association through their monthly box of galleys. You need to send it through your distributor. You need to find out that, you know, uh, Emma at Books Are Magic loves this kind of book, send it to her. You know, Daily at uh, the Common Books in Minneapolis, they love this kind of book, send it to them. Um, and then if they read it, what happens is they start talking about the books and then the, the book is stocked and sold, stocked and sold. Uh, yeah, so that's one one part of it. 
there is a uh, there's a group of people out there that are waiting to make you an, a success. They will evangelize for you, and they are called librarians. And librarians are wonderful. I, I love the library, but I and I, boy, did you you are so right. If you can get this done before the launch, it carries so much more inertia and weight. Um, you don't need a lot of people to believe in you. You just need a few who really believe in the book, and they will metastasize a cultural phenomenon online. All it takes is one small group of people who says, hey, I really like, hey, this is about space squid. I love space squid or whatever it is. And guess what? They create this, um, this flashpoint for you. But libraries, uh, here's the thing that is sort of a, a, it's not a secret, but it's something I accidentally discovered. Every state in the United States has a library meeting where they all decide what they're going to buy that year. And they, most of them, they let you walk in. Like if you, you know, if you're wearing shoes, you can walk in. So, so I found out, I, I said, wait a minute, this is, let me get this straight. This is an entire group of people with purchasing control over the budget for the state of Tennessee. And all I have to do is take some galley copies and shake hand and be myself and say, Hey, I'm Terry. This is my fifth novel. It's way better than my first novel. And I would, and I'm, and I, and that was it. And that was it. And I, have continued my relationship with libraries is uh if you look at my social media i stop when i go travel i look up the small libraries on that route central mississippi louisiana iowa wherever i am and i stop meet the librarian and give them three books and uh, i said the only thing i would like from you is a picture for my social media and they they're like this is wonderful because i solve a budgetary issue for them i get them something new and the author came by um you know uh, a, a small town in central mississippi that might not get serviced the way that it should but i'm glad they're there and so that's one of the best things that i've ever done and uh if i write for the next 30 years which i certainly hope to live that long i will continue to have a working relationship and friendship with librarians that's yeah, awesome. and I'll I'll add to that. Yeah, that that's great. That's that's a great tip. Um, you know, libra librarians are great. Another thing I would I would also say is is don't forget readers. You know, there are lots of ways to reach readers directly in today's age. So, on the self publishing side, it doesn't cost you anything to list your book on Amazon, or on Barnes and Noble, or on sites like Kobo, or Draft to Digital, which is a a book aggregator where they take your book and distribute it to places like overdrive and lots of other places that authors can't get to themselves so there are lots of readers out there you know 10 years ago people struggled with ebooks it was difficult to get people to understand the value of ebooks now people love ebooks right and so there are lots of readers out there that are browsing amazon or browsing wherever they buy their books and you can reach those readers directly by publishing directly on those platforms. And what we find, what we find on the self-publishing side is, at least on Amazon, at the time of this video, you make 70% of each sale for eBooks. And you make, eh, it depends on you know, the size of your book, somewhere around 30 to 40% um, royalties off print after printing costs and uh, Amazon and, and Ingram Spark places like that take their cut. So you can reach readers directly as well. That's another very, that's, that's how, that's how many self-published authors are making a living from their work. They're just, they're just bypassing, um, bypassing the traditional routes altogether and getting directly to readers. And then they have things like mailing lists and social media groups. So they have a way to communicate with their fans when they have a new book. So list your book directly with these places, get readers that way by advertising or, you know, making sure you're doing everything you can, as Terry said, to have a really good cover. And you can start to build your own tribe and your own community that will advocate for you, just like Terry and Gavin both said. That's, I, yeah, that's great to hear because there's a lot of questions actually in the chat about like, what about eBooks and how, how you know, what are, what are the, are there any benefits to that? And I think what you just said, Michael, are, is, I mean, yes, there are a lot of benefits to eBooks because you can get it you can get your book out far and wide i think one thing to keep in mind because i think there's also that connection of like well this is cost effective right because you're not publishing it uh physical copies and stuff like that 
up front, yes, pre pre service to you know uh, post on Amazon this book and everything. But I think what you've all kind of said uh, so far this uh, evening too is that you know there is still the cost of making sure that your words are right <laughs> on the page, right? That you're making sure that you are hiring someone who has a good eye for a cover that's going to entice and attract someone. So. Even in ebook format, there's going to be some cost up front to be able to be successful. You can post your book on Amazon right now. And I've known people to do this, just post it. And then, you know, you look at the preview and it's like, wow, they did not revise this book at all. Like the first page has 20 errors on it. And that's going to immediately, you know, turn off the reader and the audience from purchasing the book. So there is, you know, a, as much as it seems like ebook might be a quick route or an easier route, you know, there is still that cost uh, measure that you have to keep in mind with it too. But one of the things that I also noticed, and Paul, I, I'm sorry to, to cut off, but this is something that's been kind of rattling my uh, in my brain and stuff is, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, finding your group, uh, finding f uh, friends in the community, making friends with your librarians, which absolutely, yes, make friends with your librarian and stuff, right? What about the introverts though? What about those writers who are just shy? What do we do, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, they might not want, they, it might scare them to death to go up to the library and say, here's here's my book copy. Can you put it on the shelf and stuff? Is that something that just, you know, writers have to overcome in order to be successful uh, in this field? Or are there other routes or things to consider to, for those who who might be a little bit shy when approaching the business side of writing, if you will. I, I have something for this maybe that we haven't mentioned yet, and I think it's a critical resource. Uh, I'm an extrovert, so uh, I, I will talk to a stump. So however, you can let somebody do your speaking for you, and it's in the most critical way possible, and that's through audiobooks. Audiobooks, uh, we, uh, Michael, we've been talking about, uh, we haven't discussed types of readers, we're talking about types of writers, but there are types of readers and there is an entire market of people who introverts can reach by having someone do their speaking form, a professional actor who performs the book and it gets out there th via the audio sample and to librarians and everybody else. Um, and I think it's a, for us, it is the best decision we ever made. Um, I would say hands down, other than a great cover, was deciding div uh, diversifying into audio for me. And it reaches people that you would never reach otherwise. I'll say that I am the most extroverted introvert you will ever meet. <laughs> so I, I am a textbook INTJ on the Myers-Briggs scale. Um, you would never know it by all the different interviews and things that I do. I, I, I would say... You know, maybe you don't have to meet with the librarian, just drop some books off at the library sale. You know, I mean, that that there's some benefit to that. Um, when I travel, you know, a lot of hotels have uh, those little libraries where they've got uh, hardcover yeah. books and things. Why not leave a book there? That doesn't require you to handshake anybody. And uh, one of the ways that a lot of authors are making, a, building their community and making money is through newsletters. And you don't have to talk to anybody to write a newsletter. Just get readers on a newsletter list. When you have a new book, write them a letter because that's what we do as introverts. We prefer to be in front of a keyboard. You can write them a letter. Uh, it doesn't You don't really have to engage with people that much on social media either. At least you can engage with them on your terms. I mean, I have a YouTube channel and I've, I've built a community of over 40,000 subscribers. And I just do that by posting videos that I want to make and I communicate with people on my own terms. So... Just think about it in, in terms of reframing. You, you don't have to be out there shaking hands and kissing babies. You just have to connect <laughs> with people in the way that that works best for you. And for me, it happens to be through video and audio. I, I just happen to have a knack for that. But for other people, it might look different. So I just I encourage people to find their internet communication style. And so for some people, that's TikTok. For some people, it's a newsletter. For some people, it might not be any of those things. But just find that style and then double down on that. And then it won't feel like work when you're connecting with people. But it does seem like the commonality is regardless of whatever mode of connection you're, uh, you're most, most suited for, it has to, it seems like it has to be mediated through the internet, right? If you want to have a, uh, you know, a, a newsletter presence, 
there has to be a website that your that your potential readers can go to and sign up for. And yep. uh, the same, you have your YouTube channel. Um, so how 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 important is it? I mean, like how much of your uh, time uh, as a writer should be devoted to that side of the of the business, like developing, you know, keeping your website fresh, keeping your whatever your your hub is fresh and, uh, you know, um, attractive to potential uh, readers. I'll say one of my secrets that um, has paid dividends for me throughout the years is by mastering automation. So learn how to build a website that takes care of itself. Learn how to build things that take care of themselves so that you don't have to spend as much time working on them so that you can spend that time focusing on your craft. So I, when I build my websites, I'm very intentional about, okay, how can I build this in a way that, you know, links aren't going to break on me. The most recent book is always going to be on the home page, And then everything after that is kind of window dressing, right? So to think about like that, are, there's so many tools out there, so many website plugins, so many different ways you can build things. And if you think about it like that, then it, it just makes things a lot easier. Um, and, and it allows you to focus on the main thing, because I think the hardest thing about this life, at least for me, is that there's a million things you have to do, right? I mean, you have to, you have to be a writer, you have to be a marketer, you have to be a business person. I got to be a dad. I got to be a husband. I mean, I have a million things I have to do. And so I have to really focus on the main things, you know, and anything you can do to use tools to cut that time down, it, it, it adds up in a big way over time. Yeah. Um, we are unfortunately drawing close to the end of our of our night. Uh, this has been an incredible panel, and I want to thank you so much. Before we go, I want to ask you uh, each of you to to just give us a quick uh, update of like what is next for you. What what should we be looking forward to? And I, I will start with uh, Terry. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, and I learned something tonight. And. Uh, I also feel better knowing that small presses are thriving, that I think they're a sort of a critical component that we don't talk about enough because they will publish things that I gravitate to uh, some excellent choices. So um, let's see, for me, we're continuing with all three of the big series. And then I have a new series uh, starting next year. I, I'm heavy in space opera. Um, I'm launching, I, I wrote some YA. And so I'll be up in Salem, Massachusetts. I'll be at Dragon Con and my usual things, but I'll be up in Salem, Massachusetts with my witch series and uh, rolling out a new story that is uh, tragic, tragically sad. Uh, I didn't mean it to be that sad, but it's about an orphanage and an abandoned orphanage. So I don't know what I, what I was thinking, um, but it's called The Touch of Frost and it will be in print this fall. And That's I awesome. hope to see everybody out on the Great. road. You'll have to come visit me in Connecticut, Terry, when you're Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Connecticut. Love to. All right, Gavin. What about uh, you? Our our next book comes out in September. Uh got a cover that we made. Um purposefully slightly broken in text. It's it's called OK Psyche. It's a short novel by a trans woman about uh contemporary life, uh learning, learning, living in uh, Contemporary America comes out in paperback and ebook in September. Thanks, Paul and Jacob, for this panel and uh, my fellow panelists. This was great. And you, yeah, have done, no, I, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, uh, you, Gavin, you have done done your work in getting that book talked about because I I see a lot of people talking about it. Oh, Looking good. forward to it. <laughs> September. Okay, Michael. All right. Um, on the fiction side, I am I'm, I'm getting back into short stories, so. I'm doing the Ray Bradbury Challenge, 52 short stories in a year, and I'm launching a, a series with nothing but short stories. So I'm looking forward to that. And on the nonfiction side, I'm I'm looking forward to doing some more speaking. I've got a, a talk next month on dictation, so how to speak your words faster um, using a voice recorder. And so I'm kind of excited about that. And that'll be a hour long presentation and uh, all things geeking out about dictation and speaking and all that. So it's fun. It's good to hear that you're slowing down, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> got got to. Got to slow down. I'm not getting any younger. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> 52 story. The Ray Bradbury challenge. 
Well, well, but best of luck with you, and and then also yeah. the um the speed reading or uh, was it speed reading or speed speaking? Speed, 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 speed speaking. Speed, speed speaking. Yeah. Okay. Speak, speed, speaking. Speaking. Right. Speaking your speaking your stories. Yeah. Oh, okay. Excellent. Well, awesome. Well, thank you all three uh, for being here. We were so glad to have you this evening. Um, we've learned a lot, and it's just been a pleasure. I wish we could go for another hour, um, and hopefully. Uh, it, you can come back someday because there's just been such wonderful uh, advice. And I think a lot of our our students and guests have really appreciated it. Um, so thank you again. Um, and to everyone who's come, thank you so much. Um, our next Word for Word event is actually scheduled for June. Um, and it's going to feature some of our graduate uh, student or students who are graduating. It's going to be a graduate spotlight event. Uh, so uh, students who are nominated by their instructors and selected by uh, me and Paul uh, will read from their work and discuss their writing journeys with us. So stay tuned for that and have a great re uh, evening, everyone. And thank you again, uh, Terry, Michael, and Gavin. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.